Welcome to the secondary data collection and analysis in tourism research webinar, co-hosted by the US Asia Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research at Temple University and the Center for Competitiveness of the Visitor Economy at the University of Surrey. My name is Xiang Robert Lee. I'm a professor and chair of Temple University's Department of Tourism and Hospitality Management. I'm also director of the US Asia Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research. The center is committed to conduct translational research that links different disciplines, connects academics and practitioners, and building bridges between the East and West. Good data are researchers' best friends. For tourism research to be more rigorous and relevant, we need high quality data. In recent years, the landscape of, tour of tourism research has changed substantially partly because of the amounts and types of data now available to us. These data not only allow us to study many interesting topics we couldn't study before, but also shed new lights on old theories and phenomena. In this pandemic, the importance of secondary data sources has become even greater. So are the needs to identify, understand, and analyze these data. This is why we set up today's webinar, which is part of the research webinar series organized by the US Asia Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research. We're truly grateful and excited to have four brilliant speakers. To introduce them, I would like to turn to my co-host, Professor Gang Li of University of Surrey's Center for Competitiveness of the Visitor Economy. Professor Li, please. Thank you, Robert, for your introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Gang Li. I'm the director of COVE at the University of Surrey. On behalf of the COVE Research Center, I'm very delighted to co-organize this webinar together with the US Asia Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research at Temple University. Competitiveness of the visitor economy has been a long-standing theme of research at the University of Surrey. The COVE Research Center was established earlier this year it was transformed from a research group and a research cluster set up a while ago. Currently, the COVE Research Center has 18 staff members and 12 PhD students. COVE is dedicated to research on the driving forces and the influencing factors of competitiveness in the visitor economy across firm, sector, and destination levels. Some key research themes of the center include economic modeling and forecasting, innovation, entrepreneurship, risk and uncertainty, employment, and labor productivity. The research on these topics is often based on secondary data. So the webinar today is a great opportunity for all of us to exchange ideas and to share experiences on secondary data research in tourism and hospitality. Kof is very pleased to organize this webinar. Now, with my other hat on, as Associate Editor of Annals of Tourism Research Empirical Insights, I would like to acknowledge the support from this journal to the webinar. Annals of Tourism Research Empirical Insights is a new open access journal and is a companion title to the highly regarded Annals of Tourism Research Journal. And it publishes in empirically based of full research articles and the research notes where findings have important and the broad managerial and the policy implications. In my role as associate editor, I look after submissions based on secondary data research. So on behalf of the journal, I would like to invite you and welcome you to submit your future papers to this journal. And I would like to thank you for your support to this new open access journal. Now, please allow me to introduce our four distinguished speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Yang Yang. Yang is Associate Professor of Tourism and Hospitality Management and Assistant Director of the US Asia Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research at Temple University. Dr. Yang's major research interests lie in tourism demand analysis, big data analytics, as well as hotel financial and real estate analysis. 
Dr. Young's academic papers have been published in top tier tourism and hospitality journals. At the same time, Young has been serving as associate editor for Annals of Tourism Research, as well as an editorial uh, board member for a number of prestigious journals. Welcome, Young. Our next speaker, the second speaker, is my colleague, Dr. Frankie O'Connell. Frankie is currently a reader in air transport at the University of Surrey. Previous to this, he was a senior lecturer at the Center of Air Transport Management at Cromfield University. He has worked for the Boeing Commercial Aircraft Company as an analyst and for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in the United States as a lecturer. He has published a number of academic journal papers, all of which are aviation focused. He sits on the editorial board of a number of journals, including the Journal of Air Transport Management. Our third speaker today is Professor Nicholas Pipoch. Nicholas is the director of the Department of Tourism Management in the Institute of Business Administration at the University of Papillon in France. His research interests include tourism economics, tourism efficiency and productivity, and destination competitiveness. He is the co-founder of the quantitative approaches in tourism economics and management workshop series. He is also the president of the French Association for Tourism Management. Welcome, Nicolas. Our last but not least speaker today is Dr. Bozana Zekin. Bozana is an assistant professor in the Department of Tourism and Service Management at Madhu University, Vienna. She holds a Master of Science in Service Management from Rochester Institute of Technology, New York, and a doctor degree of Social and Economic Sciences with honors from the U Vienna University of Economics and Business in Austria. Her research interests are mainly within the field of destination management, including key performance indicators, competitiveness, benchmarking, efficiency studies with the application of data envelopment analysis. Welcome, Rosanna. Okay. In the next half an hour also, I would like to invite each of our four speakers to give a short presentation to share their research experience with secondary data collection and analysis. After all four presentations, we will have a Q&A sessions and I would like to invite our speakers to answer the questions from our audience. Now over to our first speaker, Dr. Yang Yang. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, to introduce. Uh, so um, today I'm going to have a presentation on uh, secondhand data, secondary data collection in tourism. So um, in this basic presentation, I will talk about what is secondary data and what kind of secondary data are available in tourism and more importantly and more importantly of course uh, where you can find all these types of secondary data so i want to start the presentation by a quote from mark twin and he said data is like garbage you have better know what you are going to do with it before you collect it so this is very interesting scene, right? So even though my topic is about data collection, but as a tourism researcher, when you started collecting data, you have to keep in mind, what is your research question, right? Not all data are used for until you have a clear idea how to leverage this data. And very interesting, this one is from Mark Truen, okay? Uh, so tourism, like many other human activities, rely on the quantification of data. Right, so there are more, many, many quantitative studies that leverage the insights from data, and also some qualitative studies also relies on the some statistics and you know quantification of some um, something. 
So what's the difference between the primary data and secondary data? So the boundary is sometimes a little bit blurred. In general, the primary data are those directly collected from the original or primary source by researchers. In general speaking, the researcher designed the questionnaire and conducted sampling to get the data. And on the other hand, the secondary data refer to the data as collected by someone else other than the user. Okay, so the common secondary data sources like censuses, information collected by government departments, organization records, and also data originally collected by uh, for other research purposes. So compared to the primary data, secondary data has some advantage. First, it's very cost effective, right? You don't need to survey, you know, make a lot of efforts to collect data. But on the other hand, sometimes you can't find a perfect match from secondary data sources because you are not the one who design the data collection or design a survey. So here are the 10 types of secondary data I want to talk about today. I know that in reality, there are way more secondary data types than that. And today I will briefly talk about official statistics, search engine, social media, foot traffic, policy data, survey and census, transport data, employment data, business performance, and the data from the general data sharing platform. So before I'm going to talk about these 10 types of data, I will show you a secondary data product that our sender created. It's called COVID-19 Tourism Index. So we leverage different secondary data source to create a list index to help the industry gorge the recovery level compared to the normal time without COVID-19. So we assign a score of 100 to indicate a normal time. So from 100, if it's 50, that means there's the uh, about 50% has potential to recover. And we collect data from different aspects, like the aviation index measures the air flight's departure volume compared to the normal time. Hotel index capture the hotel revenue per available room. The pandemic index capture the number of cases per 1 million inbound tourists and interest index measures the online search volume. And finally, the mobile index measures level of mobility to tourism related locations. And if you are interested in, you can log into www.covid19tourism.com and you can click in the map, you can click each country of interest and it will pop out the latest data as, as well as the retrospective data up to, uh, from February the 1st and the data is free to use. So let's get back to those 10 types of secondary data. The first one is official statistics. And of course, the most, most important one is the UNWTO, United Nations World Tourism Organization's data. And as this picture shows, the yearbook of tourism statistics provides one of the most comprehensive statistics of a country's tourism and tourism industry. A lot of people don't know that actually they have Excel Excel version, of course, requires extra money. I think it's very affordable. So the Excel version becomes very, very useful if you want to, you don't want to digitalize the original paper-based data. Okay, the second one is the WDI of World Bank, which called the World Development Indicator. So it's housed in a system and it's for free. But number of tourism related data is limited about 10 to 15 variables directly related to tourism, but there are other indicators that are kind of indirectly related to tourism and you can get a large indicator from large variety of countries covering a longer period of time, a long period of time. And if you are in the US, you can go to the FRAT and US travel to get some latest data. And if you are housed in Europe, of course, you know, uh, you can get all this relevant data from National Statistic Office of European countries. If you are in China, so you can go to the third party statistic website. 
like Soshu in China and CNKI data in China. And there's another one called CEI in China. Okay, I noticed that our audience actually from a diverse, very diverse geographical background. So of course I will prioritize those data applicable to everywhere. And, but that's not true for most data, right? So I will basically focus on the data from North America, the data from Europe, and sometimes the data from China, okay? The second type of data is the search engine data. It, it's very, very important. And actually it's for free for most cases, right? So uh, for the English world or typically non-Chinese world, uh, the Google trend is dominant one. So the search engine platform tells you the search volume of relevant keywords. And in this case, this graph shows the interest of hotels the keywords hotels over time, as you can see that there's an ups and down. And you can also get the search volume from different geographies and at different devices on Google Trends. Very, very interesting. And in China, uh, people are using Baidu dominantly. So they have the Baidu index instead. And some other alternatives to Baidu, they have the SoGo and 360. Another very interesting one is WeChat index. Sometimes people do the search on WeChat. So the WeChat index can be available. If you are in the WeChat, there's a small app. You can find the WeChat index to show the uh, search volume on WeChat. The third type of media I want to talk about is the social media and the general media. Okay, of course, the most effective way, if you are really, really good at technology part, you can crawl the data. Okay, you can get every single post like, you know, Weibo, uh, WeChat, or uh, Twitter, Instagram, Flickr, Facebook. But there are already some products, they synchronize, they aggregate this data for a more friendly use. And the one I really want to emphasize is this coronavirus news monitor. As this picture shows, it aggregates the latest news from different parts of the world and it generates the index. And you can subscribe to this monitor using your uh, own email. Another one I really like is GDELT project. It's not specifically related to COVID-19. It's a project to identify the events from social media. It's very gigantic database, but it definitely worthwhile everyone's attention if you are interested in, in certain events. And for Chinese media data, like the most popular Chinese social media, like WeChat, Weibo, and TikTok, right? You can go to some third party website to get the aggregate data, like daily browsing volume, daily uh, common volume, like GS data and new rank. The next one, which becomes more and more popular, especially after the COVID-19, is the foot traffic and mobility data. These types of data track people's movement from the mobile devices. Okay, so after the COVID-19, some big name website start to publish their mobility of foot traffic data like Google, Apple, and Facebook because they have a large market share. People are using their apps very frequently. So they are able to track people movement. And other than that, there are some very professional companies. They are, uh, they are the data vendor for this foot traffic and mobility data like this one, the safe graph, the four, number four and Number five, the four square, especially for the four square on visitdata.org, it's totally for free. And in China, the, the one that is dominantly used is the Tencent location heat map. So here's a picture from the food traffic and mobility data. The left hand side one is the visitdata.org. It shows you the number of visits to outdoor and recreation sites in Wyoming since February 1st. Okay, it can break down by state, by county, and by, by type of location. On the right-hand side is safe graph. Um, so it shows you the foot traffic to hotels starting from January 5th in the United States. Okay, so this data 
is still kind of free. I have to say the safe graph did a fantastic job and they even allowed the user to get free researchers to get free access to the location specific um, mobility pattern. Okay, so if you are, of course, you have to be very familiar with the data structure. If you are tech savvy, I highly recommend this food traffic data and it's very, very useful for this post COVID-19 tourism uh, studies. The next one I want to talk about is the policy data. And it, it's just related to anything about government policy. The first one is the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. As this graph shows, it shows how government respond to COVID-19 and it gives the score of the response stringency. Okay, that's called uh, response stringency index and it up, it's updated every single day. And you are able to download the raw data and at the same time, they have a sub index about policy from different aspects. Specific to tourism, there's a website from UNWTO. Uh, it lists all the measures from the national government and local government to support the travel and tourism industry. That's another very useful data set for the government policy. So survey and censuses. Uh, normally we have to see the survey, if you design a questionnaire, it's the primary uh, data, but you can still leverage other survey as the secondary data. Like you can find some industry survey results from the TTRA websites. There's a specific page called uh, COVID-19 Research Resources. And many professional consulting companies, they are doing a tourism related survey so that you can get access to their latest result. I, I don't think you can get access to the raw data, right? But at least you can get access to the latest result. Um, for the European users, Europe Barometer, this is a very, very powerful survey. And you can get the longitude, not longitude, you know, but you know, uh, the EU residents attitude toward tourism over a long period of time. And I think it's for free, including the raw data. And I know many countries, they are conducting this national tourist survey. But the one I really want to recommend is the one NTS from Canada. It covers large sample. And if you want to study some general phenomenon of the tourism behavior, irrespective of the destination, I think this one really, really make outstanding contribution to your study. And the last one is ICPSR. It's a platform that researchers share the raw data in sociology. Uh, probably there are not too many data sets are directly related to tourism, but it's definitely a charger for people who want to take a look at, you know, uh, the raw survey data from the previous surveys. So let's talk about transport data. I know Frank is going to have a deep dive into some transport data, but here I just trying to give some very brief views. Uh, there are two transport data. They are free. The first one is called Open Sky. It published every single month starting from January or February this year to combat the COVID-19. Uh, another one is ICAO, which is International Civil Aviation Organization. As this graph shows, it shows the number of air flight departures from each country's airports. Okay, so if you just want to get want to get countries aggregate, it's going to be very good resource. The employment data, very interesting. How employment going to change because of COVID nineteen or other events? So there's one called Home Base. It checks, you know, uh, I think checks people's uh, salary or they are working hours at different business across different cities, metropolitan statistic areas across the US. Another one I really like is Glassdoor. I'm not sure whether you heard of that or not. It's more like a social media platform, but it posts the employee's opinion towards certain business employers. So it also covers interesting data if you are a human resource management researcher. The business performance, very, very important, 
right? So we have STR Smith's travel research for the hotel performance data. It covers a large sample of hotels and it published the hotel performance related data for every single country, um, the some areas we see in the country. Okay, and they are the one of the most prestigious hotel data vendors in the world. And we have AirDNA, which is a data vendor for AirDNA, Airbnb related data. I know Bazana is going to talk about STR and AirDNA in further details. Okay, and also we have the MIDA data, and I think that's the data about flight booking. Okay, you know the actual flight booking from MIDT. And finally, we have factuals. This is con uh, this is a data vendor that provides the aggregate car transaction data. So we can aggregate the car transaction by geography and by type of business. Okay, remember that all major credit cards like Visa, like MasterCard, like Union Pay, they all have the data department. They are providing a data product, but that is very, very expensive. And finally, it's the general data sharing platform. Okay, if you're really, really very nerdy technical guy, you should be definitely very familiar with this GitHub, right? So there's a lot, a lot of different data sources available on GitHub. For example, they have the across state uh, government policy data, which they have someone to manually code it. And other related tourism data you can find on GitHub and also Kager's uh, there's um, more emerging data sources for a lot of, you know, uh, programmers and data analysts. And finally, the Statistica uh, becoming a more popular data platforms and many, many high ed institutions have subscribed Statistica. And I think uh, there's a lot of interesting data sets there. So all these three platforms, they have specific channel related to COVID-19. So they put all the priority to publish COVID-19 related data. And another reason I really like Statistica, as you can see from this graph, okay, it's not just simply published data. It tells you a story, okay? Like in this case, food delivery service in Europe, it combined all the data together. So you know the nuts and bolts about a specific topic with sufficient data supports. Okay, so that's all the 10 types of that data. Um, so now we have the data, but the data are of different data formats, right? Of course, we like numeric data. That's what we learn from our graduate classes, right? But now we have a geo data. We have to use spatial modeling. We have temporal data, it's time series. We have text data, text mining, topic mining, sentiment analysis, even though this is, seems to be way too fancy 10 years ago. But nowadays, many, many software are able to do this. And we have psychophysiologic data, like eye tracking, like you know, uh, people's health related data. That's fantastic. And finally, now we have video data, like photos and videos. That means we have to come up with new tools to analyze this data. And the data analysis, normally for secondary data analysis, we are going to use econometrics multivariate statistics. I think uh, other speakers will delve into these topics later. Spatial modeling, if you have spatial data, AI, deep learning, artificial intelligence, especially if you want to analyze text data or the video data, AI is the future direction. I just want to emphasize a little bit on the last two. The first one is called meta analysis. What is meta analysis? Meta analysis is to do the statistics on the statistics. I didn't cover this as the secondary data sources. Basically, if there are multiple studies starting the same topic using different data, we can grab their statistics out like correlation or regression coefficient and do the analysis based on this coefficient to synchronize the result. That's what we call a meta analysis. And finally, we have cytometric analysis. That, is, that means we are, analyzing the literature, right? Like this graph shows, there's a paper trying to study the topic on climate change and tourism. And this graph calls called citation plot. It shows out how different co-authors cite papers, 
right? So this is another secondary data source. It's just our literature, but we don't have time to go through. Okay, I think that's all for my presentation today. And I would like to thank, I really appreciate the support from the colleagues at Surrey University because they uh, provide all the data information uh, for the Europe related data. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, without further ado, I will turn the floor to my, uh, my friend Frankie at University of Surrey. Absolutely fabulous. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, give you an insight into secondary data sets, but there's an aviation context. And um, I was very happy to see that Yang um, actually mentioned them in his presentation. So I'm uh, so you've you've laid you've laid the foundation stone right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you two Excel spreadsheets, and I'm going to show you a, a short presentation. So I'll give you an insight into um, the, the 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 data sources that we have in in. in in aviation is an OAG data set, okay? So and, um, it, it, it gives you everything in relation to capacity, airline capacity. So because this seminar is about uh, Asia, US, all right, North America, I've taken traffic basically from China to North America, okay? So keep that in mind now, traffic from mainland China and to North America. So if you see the carrier name here, I, I've put all this in pivot tables. So I, there's actually an, a lot of work Work extract here. These are all the airlines that operate between Asia, or between China and 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 um, North America. These are all the departing airports, right, from mainland China. Okay. Here are all the arriving airports in North America: Montreal, Seattle, uh, Chicago, Vancouver, etc. Now, here are all the airport pairs. So you can see the first one there is Beijing to Montreal. Next one, Beijing to Seattle, for example. So it gives you all the, 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 the pairs um, fr from China to North America. And then we can break it down by, obviously by country, right? Um, arriving country, Canada, USA. And what's cool here is it gives you all the aircraft types as well. So this is actually great for monitoring um, environmental environmental concerns. So here shows you the old generation 777-200 aircraft, the new generation 787-9. So um, what we've done here is, is we, we've looked at all, so I'll, I'll show you the, 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 the graphical representation. Now, remember again, this is from China to North America. So frequency is the number of flights, okay? Number of flights. And we can do it per month, per week, per day. Okay. So obviously to... To give you some of the, the number of flights, okay? Um, and you can see a course during the pandemic the number of secondary data. It gives you real um, visibility in the data, all right? Um, so down here, we have the number of seats supplied by all these airlines. And remember now the seats are broken down into first class, business class, premium economy class, and economy class seats by aircraft type. And you can see that the number of seats were, was, 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 had maintained uh, at a certain level. The reason they haven't increased is because there is not open skies between China to, to the USA, for example. Open skies means 
uh, airlines can ha have a huge amount of, of flights. But if I don't have open skies, the, the, the flights are constrained. And you can see here again, the number of seats have collapsed from China to North America because of the, the pandemic. And look, we can go down deeper and we can take a look at the HHI. And you can see that the HHI increased because the number of airlines operating reduced during the, the pandemic itself. So um, I'm just going to go out of this now and I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you another. I'm going to show you another. Um, um, another data set. Now, this is a data set called MIDT, right? MIDT data. So this is the demand data now, the demand data, okay? So here you can see China to North America, okay? And we can break it down by business class passenger, right? Uh, passengers traveling in economy class, passengers traveling in premium economy, and the passengers traveling in first class, okay? So over here, we can take a look at the airfares. So the average airfare in business class, okay, during all of, all of 2017 was $1,751, right? Between China to North America. So here we've got the economy class, the average fare there was $502. Uh, Premium economy class, the average fare was $952 and first class, it was uh, a whopping $2,621, right? And, and um, obviously we, we, we can break it down. This would be January, February, March down, down, down to December. So then we can take a look at the, um, at, at the, here are the revenues now airlines are making. So you can see here, that the airlines made this amount of money in 2017, carrying traffic from China to North America. So what is that? That's about uh, 88, that's about $88 billion, right? Um, carrying first class passengers, sorry, carrying business class passengers. Carrying, this is carrying economy class passengers, this is carrying premium economy class passengers, and this is carrying first class passengers. So then we can take a look at the total passengers that were carried. So in this particular year, the average fare then between first class, business class, premium economy class, economy class was about nearly $700. And the airlines, this is what the airlines made in total traveling from um, China to, to North America. So then, Look, it's probably even better to, to show you um, the, the graphical representation. So this shows you here, sorry. This shows you here that um, the number of passengers car carried between China and North America. Obviously, you can see that most of the passengers car are, are being transported in economy class, right? Um, followed then by, by business class itself. And over here, we can see the average fare being brought, the average fare, right, by, by class between, between those, between those uh, markets. And here is the revenue generated, right, by passenger segment, okay? So it's a very, very, very rich data set, right? And you can combine this with other data sets and you can produce a really cool, innovative, um, research platform. So now I'm going to go out of this again, and I'm going to um, go back in and I'm going to load up. Uh, I've got a very short, short, short presentation here now as well. Okay, so, so um, the two data sets I showed you was OAG Analyzer, and, and this gives um, the supply data. Okay, so this gives all the seats, all the frequencies, okay, of nearly a thousand airlines around the world serving 4,000 airports. And what's really cool about this is that um, 57 million records are updated every year. So if the fare changes, um, it, it captures it, for example. If, it, it, if the airlines decide to reduce capacity, it, it captures it. 
The one thing OAG does not capture are chartered flights, okay, and air cargo flights. But chartered flights are a very small component of, of air travel today, but it, and it doesn't capture air cargo flights. That's a different um, database again. And the other one is Sabre, MIDT data. This gives you the demand data. So here we've got the passenger demand, the fares on the routes, the revenues earned on the routes. And we could break it down by route to country, country to country, continent to continent. Um, we can even do, uh, for example, Wuhan to the whole continent of Europe. Right, so it's it's very um, very robust in, in that respect, and it, it captures the indirect booking. So if a, if a passenger books on an online travel agent, or if they book through a travel agent, it will capture that, and it has an algorithm built in as well to also capture the, the bookings through an airline website. So it's uh, very very uh, rigorous. So just to give you a, a, an example now, the, the, right. So I just ran this traffic data there um, from China to Europe now, okay? And you can see that um, the number of seats absolutely collapsed, okay, during the pandemic, right? So we can capture all the changes that are going on in the global airline industry. But what happens here with secondary data in particular is that uh, it, 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 it reinforces uh, what's going on in the world, okay? So it gives you that solid database and solid data to say, this is exactly what the commercial world is, 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 is what's happening in the commercial world. So here, again, China to Europe. And if we index everything at, in March, uh, 2017, okay? We index everything at hundred. So we can see that the number of passengers increased, the, the revenues increased, the fares increased, and the number of seats increased, okay? But by the time we get to 2020, right, uh, you can see that the revenues have collapsed, right, between China to Europe. We can see that um, the, the number of seats have fallen dramatically. However, the airfare kind of stayed a little bit high there in, 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 that, in, in that one. You know, so 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 the airlines um, reduced the, the 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 their presence on markets, but they actually had you know the airfare did did, did was not was was not um, overly uh, reduced. Now, if we take a look at two city two 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 markets itself, okay. So here would be on the left Beijing to Shanghai. Now, Beijing to Shanghai is a huge cash cow for, for, for the airlines operating on it. In fact, China Eastern makes half of their money, half of their, sorry, half of their profit from Beijing to Shanghai. So that's incredible. Um, and you can see here that uh, during the pandemic, the, the traffic, the, the fares, the revenues, the seats, they all, they all collapsed, right? And if we take a look then on the right-hand side from Beijing to Munich, Germany, okay? So here we got, um, China to, to, a, to a European market, all right? The same sort of rhetoric happens here as well, but the data is proving what's happening, what's happening out there. And that's what's cool about, about secondary data. It, it really reinforces the, 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 the and, and solidifies the, the, the data itself. And look at what the data can do as well, for example. Here um, in March, 2017, uh, the top 10 airlines in, in China, right, right, uh, made uh, about over four, $4.2 billion in revenues, okay? By 2000, and, and in, in the month of March 2019, the top 10 Chinese airlines in domestic China made about $6 billion in revenues. And you can see then March 2020, right, a huge drop, you know, and, and what then does that in, in, in you know, that impact then has an, an enormous ramification to the financial success of, of a carrier. So now moving on. Um, so I, I'll now show you what, what we did to apply some of this data to a, a, a very prestigious journal like the Annals of, of Tourism Research. So remember, um, 
in, in bygone years, okay, 2015 to 2017, there were a lot of terror. Um, so for example, here in Copenhagen, in Copenhagen into February, okay? So, so if I take you to, to the $302, so the average airfare from Europe to Copenhagen was $302. Then the airlines reacted, okay? And they lowered the fare in March, lowered the fare in April, lowered the fare in May in comparison to February. And it really wasn't until, until, until basically nearly November, November, right? October, November, did, did, did the uh, airlines increase the airfares going, going to Copenhagen. And here is United States to Copenhagen, for example, right? So the attack happened in February and the airfare was lower all the way out until September of that year. So it's a, it, it's, it's a great kind of a mechanism to really drill down in, 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 into the data. Now, here is um, the number of, the, the, the number of seats supplied to a market. So here we got all the, 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 the cities on top that had terrorist attacks, but Brussels, the traffic to Brussels from all over the world fell by a whopping 12 and about 12%, sorry, 12%, right, 12%. Okay, now, 30 days after the attack, all right, so we got deep, deep 30 here, uh, the traffic from all over the world to Brussels fell by 12%. This was the highest increase. And the reason it fell the highest in Brussels was because there was a terrorist attack in the airport in Brussels. All the other attacks happened in downtown, okay? But in Brussels, the attack happened at the airport, right? So, so that was a very interesting find as well. So that's what the data can do. It can really give huge, you know, you know, uh, insights in, into what's happening out there. And then, um, just as a question out to you people, okay? So, it, so if there's an attack, is there a greater loss of, uh, if there's a terrorist attack in a, uh, on a European city, do you think there's a greater loss of, of leisure traffic? Or do you think there's a greater loss of, of business traffic? What would you think? So I'll, I'll let you ponder that for about three or four seconds before I tell you. So again, if there's a if there's a terrorist attack, is and then traffic going to that city, will there be a bigger loss of of leisure traffic, or will there be a bigger loss of business traffic? What do you think? Right, and here's the answer. Right, so we were blown away at this here. So if we take a look at Paris, all right, in 2015 in January, business traffic fell. 30 days after the attack by a whopping 53%. And if we take a look at the November attacks where there was, uh, I think well over 200 people lost their lives in that attack, sorry, right? 200 people lost their attack. The business traffic fell by almost 70%. So this, we were, we were amazed at this and we decided we got to drill down deeper and find what's going on here. So we asked these companies then, Apple, IBM, John Deere, Caterpillar, Dell, right? what's happening? And they said, listen, if there's a terrorist attack, we've got a corporate social responsibility to our executives traveling to these cities. So if they don't want to go, that's fine, you know? And, and, um, but, and when we compared the leisure traffic, we found uh, the leisure traffic did not fall that much, but the business traffic fell incredibly so. So, um, so basically, uh, this secondary data is very uh, insightful, very exciting, and you can find really, really great uh, insights. So I'd like to thank you all very, very, very much. And um, I'll, I'll now hand it over to um, my next colleague. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Frankie. And uh, thanks again, uh, for the invitation to participate to this uh, webinar. Okay, share my screen. So uh, I will talk to you about uh, data for uh, efficiency and productivity uh, analysis. 
and I will focus uh, my presentation to the case of non-parametric uh, approaches based on uh, linear programming techniques like uh, the DA method. I will uh, propose you a presentation with the first slide. In the first slide, uh, I, will, uh, I will present one kind of data we need in order to conduct a study in terms of efficiency and productivity analysis in tools and research. Uh, in the second and third slides, I will uh, propose uh, two examples of studies and I will conclude with some challenges about the data collection for tourism efficiency and productivity in tourism research. So about the data we need in order to implement an efficiency analysis. Uh, we have two stages. Uh, what is important in the first stage is to define what we term a production technology. So the production technology is a, a definition and the transformation of different resources and inputs into outputs. And the production technology represents a production possibility set, which is represented here by this graph. And the data we need for the inputs and outputs directly depend on the decision-making units we will analyze on a given sample. From an economic viewpoint, we need at least two kinds of uh, inputs related to labor and capital factor. And after, we can choose different kind of outputs uh, related to the units uh, we compare. So one of the main difficulties when we implement uh, an efficiency and productivity uh, analysis in order to define and characterize the production technology, in the selection of the data, we need to respect uh, some rules. There is not absolute rules, but uh, we can be careful about the number of uh, inputs and outputs we will choose and the sample size we have in order to keep the discriminatory power of the efficiency method we use. When we obtain the efficient production frontier represented in blue in this graph, and uh, we can measure uh, the distance between the frontier and the units uh, in order to obtain uh, efficiency and productivity scores, what is important in a second stage is to explain, to try to explain what we observe differences in terms of performance, efficiency, and productivity. And in order to explain these differences, we need uh, other data. We have in general two options. The first option consists to uh, characterize the unit we analyze in the sample in group or category effects. And we will study, for instance, uh, with um, independent tests, uh, the independence or not between the efficiency level and the group of the category effect of the unit. And the second option is to uh, characterize what we term contextual or environmental factors it's like exogenous factors, and we can use after regressions on the efficiency score. So I will provide you a, a first uh, example in the hospitality sector. This uh, example is about data at the macro level. Here, we study the hospitality sector in China at the provincial level, so regional uh, level. We will use a different uh, kind of uh, data for state-rated hotels in China and uh, uh, annual data. So in order to construct the production technology, the different inputs are the following. We can use, for instance, uh, uh, total fixed assets in order to characterize uh, financial uh, capital factor. We can use number of rooms uh, in order to characterize the uh, accommodation capacity of each uh, province uh, in China. And the number of employees reflects the labor factor. Regarding the outputs, we can conduct different kinds of analysis. Uh, the number of rooms sold represents the attractiveness of the hospitality sector in the, in the China's region. And after, the total revenue uh, can characterize the economic repercussions for the province. And uh, here we have different options. We can use with these methods uh, the total revenue in order to represent and characterize the economic repercussions or split the revenue in different kinds of revenue. For instance, in the hospitality sector, catering revenues, room revenues, and other revenues. And what is important, if we consider different kinds of production technologies, we will obtain different efficiency score. Okay, so different conclusions and different findings. All these uh, data are provided by the China Tourism Statistical Yearbooks. Uh, it's a very useful um, sources uh, for the statistics in China about tourism and hospitality sector provided for each province and each year 
and separately for each uh, star rated hotels from the two star to the five star hotels. In the second stage, uh, we use uh, uh, different kind of factors very specific to China. For instance, uh, some indexes related to the degree of uh, marketization of uh, internet about the development of digital tools, tools and the low environment. And the idea is to provide with our findings some uh, recommendation for the policy makers of each provinces in China. The second example is about data in the same vein, but micro level data for ski resorts. Um, here the unit uh, is a ski resource. Uh, I mean uh, the ski lift operator of the ski resort. Okay. And uh, in this uh, paper, we compare 56 French ski resorts depending on different uh, range mountains uh, in France. So, as the unit is very different at the micro uh, level, we can conduct and construct different kind of uh, production technologies. Again, uh, we need to identify some uh, factors related to capital and to labor. Okay, so for instance, number of slopes and number of ski lifts of each ski resource, we characterize uh, a kind of uh, technical capital factor, physical capital factor for each ski resource. The outputs reflect here on the one hand with the turnover of ski lift operators, the economic repercussion for the ski resource, and with the number of ski days, the attractiveness of uh, each ski resource. And what is interesting with this data they are provided by one main source, which is Mountain Leader magazine. This kind of magazine is a professional uh, magazine published each, each year for each ski resort in France. Okay, and the data are not annual because it's ski resorts, so as they are linked to winter season data. At the micro level, uh, we are not talking in terms of recommendation with policy makers. Our decision maker is, uh, for instance, the manager of the ski resort or the owner. So the data for the second stage are very specific and related to, for instance, the size of the ski resort, ownership, public or private, and the location of the ski resort, for instance, in terms of elevation. And what is interesting also in these two examples are the macro level data or micro level data. For instance, in the hospitality sector, the main provinces in China with the most beautiful tourism attractions, when we compare the relative efficiency, they are not mainly efficient, okay? All depend of the ability to the tourism destination to use the resources and the attractions. It's the same here for the ski resorts. For instance, big ski resorts are not the most efficient. So, in order to conclude, I will just underline uh, two challenges in the selection and availability of the data. Um, my first remark is about uh, the input we can choose in the production technology. Okay. Uh, in economics, uh, we use uh, capital factor and labor factor. Okay. And we follow what we learned when we were students in microeconomics. But some uh, inputs are very difficult to obtain regarding the data. For instance, an input related to the human capital in the studies is missing. Very few studies in the empirical literature obtain data about human capital, okay? But uh, such kind of data characterize, for instance, the experience of the employees, the knowledge, the number of educational years of the employees, and is very important in the production process in order to evaluate and compare the relative performance. So for future studies, uh, we need to include some more specific inputs, okay? Not just the main basic labor and capital factor. A second remark is about uh, such kind of specific data. When we compare, especially at the macro level, uh, the performance of tourism destinations at the regional or the provincial level, one very useful uh, variable is the number of tourism attractions. It's very well used in the studies about the French sector, but also, for instance, in China, with a very well, well known five rated A, the five A tourism attractions in China. Okay, but the problem of this kind of data, we can use either input in order to define the production technology in first stage or keep it for the second stage in order to have explanatory power of the findings we obtain from the first stage. 
And the issue for future research is uh, we need to, to choose if we can use such kind of data as an input or in the second stage as a contextual factor. Okay, and this is a, a very important issue for future research in applied production analysis and tourism research. Thank you for your attention, and I give the floor to Bozana. Thank you, Nicolas. I'm really happy to follow in your foot tracks because we are talking about the same methodology. So you explained everything, so I can skip the methodological part. So let me share my presentation with you now. So what I will be talking about is basically um, is zooming into Airbnb listings, lessons learned from investigating the sector's competitiveness and demand modeling, right? So uh, basically uh, what you will hear from me is basically some of the lessons learned that we did when looking into the air DNA data and STR data. So if you look into the Airbnb listings in general and their impact on tourism industry, we hey, can Prasanna, see- yes? sorry, we can see your screen. Are you, okay, sorry. Yeah. Let me just see, sorry about this. Yeah, no problem. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Yes, that's perfect. perfect. Sorry about this. <laughs> Thank you. So let's start with a mini literature review. So basically, if you look into the body of literature on Airbnb last seven years, you will see that there was a literally explosion of articles. Close to 200 articles have been published. So we can see a debate about positive and negative impacts of Airbnb. Some people call it disruptive innovation, call it unequal playground for the entire accommodation industry, saying that, for instance, the Airbnbs are causing a lot of negative impacts for the low end small businesses in contrast to major hotel chains. But in reality is that the fact that the Airbnb listings are all over the world, they are very popular among young people in particular, also for the families and also for price sensitive people. And as such, they may be influencing demand for hotels, right? And if this happens, they will also influence their revenues as well. So, what we also noticed when we started our work on Airbnb studies was that this impact that they are doing on destinations and the role that they may play in the overall competitiveness of a destination simply can't be ignored, right? So this was also the case definitely pre-COVID-19 and it remains to be seen what happens to Airbnb after COVID-19, right? What kind of impact it will have on the overall sector. So without further ado, so when we were doing our structure for the research on Airbnb, we decided to focus on three teams which are basically our two cents of contribution to this growing body of research. So if you look into team one, for instance, you will see that our focus is on assessing competitiveness, efficiency of the Airbnb sector across European cities. This is where we actually benchmark the Airbnb listings across Europe. And we were investigating how competing with the sharing economic sector of European cities. The second team that we wanted to push with was basically inclusion of the factors that Nicola was already mentioning, these uncontrollable input variables into modeling of the sector competitiveness. Right? So huge impact of, for instance, what happens if we include, for instance, hotel variables? What will happen with the efficiency of the Airbnb listings? And lastly, the team three that I work together primarily with Uli Gunther is basically modeling of Airbnb demand. And the study that we did together about modeling Airbnb demand to New York City, where we employed spatial panel data that Yang was already introducing in his presentation at the listings level. So since we are running out of the time, I can really focus only just on one team one. So I will give you a sneak peek at our first study. And I put the references here just in case you are interested to read more about our work. So 
the variables we used were 11 variables. And what we did is like, you could see what Nicolas was mentioning, different input and output variables. We used 11 ones across 10 different models because one of the pitfalls when it comes to data envelopment analysis modeling, many studies are actually static. And what we did is we added this interactive note to it. So we added additional nine models to the core, to the base model. And the data source we used is also the AirDNA that Young mentioned. And what we did is we actually purchased the data from AirDNA for the period for one year, as you could see. This was also related to one of the projects that we did. So this is why we had this period. And what we did in our study is basically we were considering only active listings, meaning though that has non-zero number of bookings. And since we were not interested in destination benchmarking, we were really solely interested in the sector benchmarking because we considered Airbnb sector as a sector, right? Or if you are picky, then you can say it's a subsector of the overall accommodation. So what we tried to do is basically we wanted to measure the efficiency of the Airbnb sector per across European cities. And the most plausible approach for us to do this kind of performance analysis of the overall sector of the European cities was to work with averages of different variables besides, of course, number of properties. And just to show you the cities that we worked with in data envelopment language, we use this DMU acronym for a decision making unit. So we are making the efficiency or the competitiveness, we are computing it for these units. We used names of the cities as a proxy for its listings. So you can see that we had cities such as Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin, Reykjavik, Rome, Vienna, so all the major European cities. Again, the focus was placed in Europe because this was connected to our project here in Vienna. And what also, why we chose these 29 cities to work with is as per European cities marketing, all of these cities are Premier League cities which means that they have achieved more than 1.5 million of bed nights in hotels and similar establishment. So even if you look separately on these traditional forms of accommodation, these are definitely the winners, the cities. So this was our justification be behind using these cities in our sample. And to show you briefly our model, so some of the variables that we used, again, this is just the base model. On the input side, we were using number of properties, maximum number of guests, minimum number of nights, and number of photos. On the output side, we worked with annual revenues, occupancy rates, number of bookings, and overall ratings. The outcome of our modeling, which was output oriented BCC radial model of DEA was basically we got the overview of the efficient and inefficient units and the beauty of DEA, what, what it makes it so superior when it comes to efficiency modeling is this benchmarking nature of the and we also came up with the partners and weights and we, and we also calculated the virtual benchmark. And to give you a feeling for this interactivity note, these nine alterations that we did with our model, for instance, on the input side, we kept, we always kept number of properties because this was a clear indication for us in terms of saturation of the Airbnb listings per city, right? We were alternating between maximum number of guests and also number of bedrooms as a proxy for size. Uh, minimum number of nights we kept, number of photos, and then we added, added also response rate of the hosts into the model. And on the output side, we were adding average daily rate and also replacing annual revenue with ADR. So always at any given time, we had nine variables at most, which is in line with this rule of thumb in terms of how many variables we can have in our model. So this what you see, it's our base model. 
And just to show you some of the results. Okay. So what you can see here would be list of the inefficient units. So we, you see the listings of seven cities out of our 29 cities being inefficient. So based on this base model, then we call it like model zero for us. So uh, what you can see since this is the output oriented modeling, everything above 100% would indicate inefficiency. So this would imply that Vienna is close to 1.5% inefficient when it comes to basically modeling the four input variables that I have showed you on the previous slide. And what you can also see is that Barcelona is the most inefficient city in the sample, close to 7% of inefficiency, which also indicates how much room for the improvement it has, right? And as I mentioned, this beauty of DEA when it comes to benchmarking, on the right-hand side of the table, you can also see the benchmarks and the weights. And what you see, for instance, for Barcelona in particular, you see that city listed number one, 13, 23, and 27. These would be the bench proposed benchmarking partners for Barcelona. What you see in the brackets here would be the weights. So the most weight has been placed on the unit number 23, which is Reykjavik. So Barcelona's ideal partner, when it comes to modeling these eight particular variables is Reykjavik, right? And what the common trait of DEA is that DEA actually computes the weights based on from the data. They are not fixed a priori. And concerning the efficient ones, you can see also the list of efficient and why you see such a detailed background breakdown is basically due to the fact that I included this super efficiency. Otherwise, you would only see 100%, which means efficient. So everything, since again, this is output oriented modeling, everything 100 and below would be efficient. The cities and at the bottom level of the table from Tallinn to Cologne, have big, which means they are super high efficient. And then Dublin to Budapest, they're all efficient, but Dublin is still outperforming Budapest by almost 28%, right? And what you can also see in the, in the last column is the benchmarking appearance, which states how many times the listings of a particular cities have been proposed as benchmarks. So it's also clear that some cities are efficient, but they are not necessarily benchmarks for us. And few lessons learned for us from this study were basically when we look across all these models, it's basically six to eight li listings of the cities were categorized as inefficient across different models. Listings of five cities, meaning Barcelona, Istanbul, Lisbon, and Madrid and Vienna, they were inefficient irrespective of what we modeled. So this is a clear warning sign that there is a room for improvement. We also had listings of four cities that were shifting between inefficient and efficient groups, which was really cool, I must say, because this is where the cities can immediately see with which variable there is a problem. Is it when it comes to response rate, for instance, or number of photos? So the room for improvement is indicated. And I guess the two main takeaways for us from this study were that being efficient that does not translate into being the best practice example, and that there is no such thing as universal best practice when it comes to modeling competitiveness of Airbnbs. And of course, when we finished this study, we came up with million limitations for, of our own work. And this is where I would want to introduce to you what we are doing now as well. So we are working on including uncontrollable input variables that relate to traditional forms of accommodation establishments, meaning number of hotel rooms and ADR of hotel rooms per city. This will help us to further account for the heterogeneity and also to inspect the impact of these hotel variables on the efficiency scores, right? So 
What we are also doing is we are separating private and commercial listings because the current study was taking all listings of the city into account. But we want to see whether there is a difference between the efficiency or competitiveness of the listings that are only privately owned or owned commercially, right? And here we use again the AirDNA data and also SDR as data source. So we are very, very grateful to Steve Hood here for helping us out with the data sources here. And lastly, I also want to give you a few highlights from our study on modeling Air Airbnb demand. It's a bit different, but there is still this competitiveness connotation. What we did in this study is basically mo we modeled the Airbnb demand only to New York City, employing spatial panel data at the listing level. So meaning we were incorporating these, these geo coordinates right into our, our data. And our mission was to investigate if the traditional accommodation industry, meaning hotels and similar establishments, are a substitute or a complement for Airbnb in New York. Right, because for instance, in Vienna, this was a clear case of being a complement, right? So no competition there. And this was also our, the first study to quantify income elasticities of Airbnb demand. And our main takeaways from this study were that demand is price inelastic for Airbnb accommodation in New York City, which is a luxury good. So we could talk about income elastic. And what was also came up being very, very clear after doing the, this, the modeling was that the city traditional accommodation industry and neighboring listings were actually substitutes. So we have a clear case of competition. So in case there were a number of implications then for hotel industry in terms of what they can do in order to fight the competition from the Airbnbs. And lastly, uh, to, I showed you many numbers and words, but I also wanted to finish up with one picture. So this is from our article. This is also just to show you spatial distribution of Airbnb listings in New York City. Of course, we did not work with all the listings in New York City. We had a cross section of 1,461. If I remember well, of Airbnb listings, they're close to 48,000, I believe. But what we were looking at, again, we looked at the listings that were constantly active within the period that we analyzed as well. So what you can see here would be in the orange color would be the commercial ones, meaning when the host has two or more listings and the blue ones are private ones. And already here you can see differing densities when it comes across neighborhoods because you, you can definitely see a pressure on Manhattan, right? And also some form of spatial dependency is also evident here from this one figure as well. So this completes my presentation. Thank you very much again to Gang Li and Yang Yang for inviting me to this seminar. And now I hand over to Gang to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Rosanna. And uh, thank you all. Young, Frankie, Nicholas, and Rosanna for giving us such insightful presentations about your research using secondary data. Now we are coming to the Q&A session. I would like to thank Young for being so efficient in dealing with all of the questions raised during the webinar. We do receive a couple of questions uh, uh, before the webinar when colleagues, uh, participants were registering for this webinar. And due to the time constraint here, I would like to uh, ask uh, one question to all of our four speakers. I think it has a common interest among all of us. What are the future trends for using secondary data in your area of research? I would like to invite each of our four speakers to share their experience from their own research area, research field perspective. May I start with young, please? Yeah, I, I, my, um, on the top of my mind, I think probably because of reliability issues and probably the future trend is to, <coughs> excuse me, to have multiple secondary data source to investigate similar uh, questions and to see whether they can reach similar conclusion or not. Yeah, I see that's a one potential future trend. 
Great, thank you very much, Yang. Now may I turn to Frankie. So from the air transport research perspective, what do you see as the new trends using secondary data? I think that the, the air transport industry, the, the data coming in is uh, of a commercial context. So because of that, it's very robust, it's very accurate. It's checked rigorously by other competitors. So, so I think that it's here to stay for a long time. And it, it, it would be a really great thing to, in my opinion, to start combining secondary data with primary data. So, so for example, this is the secondary data. And if we do an interview with someone of, 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 of authority, then they can, they can confirm and they can uh, synergize what the data is, is actually saying. So I think that it will never go away. It's here for forever. And uh, we should continuously build on it as in the research. Thank you, Frankie. I totally agree with you. Combining different data sources will definitely be a trend, a common trend, not necessarily within air transport research, but also in tourism, hospitality, and the broader field of social science. Triangulation based on multiple sources using the qualitative primary data and the quantitative primary data, survey data, experimental design data, and the secondary data will certainly increase the rigor of our research and the external validity of our findings. Thank you, Frankie. Now may I turn to Nicholas. Thanks, Gang. Uh, the future trend, I believe, uh, in the study of efficiency for destination uh, competitiveness with uh, macro level data is the following. Um, the tourism frontiers of the tourism destination are not the administrative borders, okay? I mean, when we study a relative efficiency uh, for the French regions or for the Chinese provinces, all the data we have follow the administrative border of the region or the province. But in the real world, the tourism destination is different. We can have a tourism destination in a given country, which is a part of two separate regions of provinces. So uh, the main issue with the secondary data is to obtain the more precise and relevant uh, data for the tourism destinations. Great, many thanks, Nicholas. Now, Rosanna, please. From my side, like, there have been a lot of discussions about the impact of COVID-19 and what kind of tourism, of course, we will want to pursue after. And there's a lot about responsible and sustainable tourism, right? So oftentimes, whenever we are trying to find the data and whenever we are doing also the benchmarking reports for ECM, oftentimes finding these economic indicators is very easy. But uh, oftentimes we are also asked that we, it would be so great if we could basically include more indicators that deal with social and environmental dimensions. So I think we will have to put much more emphasis on all three dimensions. Right? that we go beyond the pure economic, but they take also the aspects from social and environmental dimension in order to persevere in the future. I think this would be a major push for us. Great, thank you very much, Bozana. Yeah, I agree with you. The multi-dimensional research of the whole tourism system and also across multiple interdisciplinary research is also the general trends of tourism hospitality research into the future. Right, time flies. I realize it's quite late for our participants and attendees in Asia, it's midnight already. Um, although we have to end this webinar here, our passion and dedication to exciting, innovative and impactful research will definitely continue. And our conversation and the discussion about this exciting topic using secondary data for tourism and the hospitality research will continue. We look forward to continuous conversations in future occasions. Now, let me invite Professor Robert Lee to conclude this webinar. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. Um, what an insightful and informative session. 
On behalf of all our attendees, I would like to thank our four speakers, Dr. Frankie O'Connor, Professor Nicholas Paypak, Dr. Yang Yang, and Dr. Bozana Zekan. Once again, for your time and efforts in speaking in this webinar. On behalf of our, our speakers and organizers, we would also like to thank all of our attendees. I know many of you have to stay up late or get up early to attend this event. Finally, we would like to thank the staff and students of Temple University's US Asia Center for Tourism and Hospitality Research and School of Sport Tourism and Hospitality Management for facilitating this event. Thanks everybody. Wherever you are, please stay healthy, positive and safe. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.